Herzlich willkommen, meine Damen und Herren, zu Surkamp Diskurs. Mein Name ist Mariam Lau. Ich bin Redakteurin im Politikressort der Zeit. Und ich freue mich wirklich sehr, einen Tag vor der Inauguration äh, des neuen amerikanischen Präsidenten Joe Biden mit dem Mann zu sprechen, der Joe Biden in den letzten Jahren am engsten begleitet hat, der die interessanteste und intelligenteste Joe Biden-Biografie geschrieben hat. Das ist der amerikanische Journalist und Autor Evan Osnos. Evan Osnos schreibt seit 2008 für den New Yorker, für den er äh, zunächst fünf Jahre aus China äh, berichtet hat. Auch darüber hat er ein großartiges Buch geschrieben. Ich bewundere seine Texte seit langem. Und ähm, ja, freue mich sehr, mit ihm heute zu sprechen. Und um das zu tun, werden wir jetzt in die englische Variante des Programms äh, switchen. Hello, Evan Osnos. Welcome to the program. Oh, it's great to be with you. Thanks for, thanks for the invitation. It's great to talk to you. And I understand you're not in Washington, even though you live there uh, today. Mm. But of course, we're... we're extremely curious to know what it looks like uh, in Washington, especially the area around the Capitol. Yeah, it's a very strange time. You know, I, I live with my family in Washington. We live downtown about a mile from the White House, a couple of miles from the Capitol. And uh, I'm only up here in New York as of a few hours ago uh, in order to be able to do some coverage from up here or sort of distributing correspondence around different places, partly because we can't be entirely sure what the day will mm -hmm. hold on January 20th. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But the scene in Washington is surreal. Uh, I have covered a lot of countries over the years. I was based in Iraq for a while where there was a green zone. After all, that's where we, in some cases, really learned that terminology. And now in Washington, they have officially declared downtown a green zone. So it is a strange full circle that we have come as a country mm -hmm. over the last mm -hmm. 17, 18 years to go from the mm -hmm. green zone in Baghdad to the green zone in Washington. Mm -hmm. Very scary prospect. So are you nervous or fairly well, confident? I would say in the short term, I'm actually quite uh, reasonably calm and optimistic. In the mm -hmm. medium term and the long term, I'm afraid I'm nervous. And we can talk in more detail. The reason why I'm sort of calm in the short term is that the level of security in Washington right now is extraordinary. And mm. it would take a, a really unusual level of planning, not impossible, um, but to achieve some sort of attack on the Capitol at this point uh, during the inauguration. It's a very different setting and scenario than it was on January 6th. I was at the Capitol on January 6th during that mm -hmm. riot. And I can tell you that the scene there was one in which the authorities were utterly unprepared. This is right. a different moment right now. They've been mm -hmm. preparing for this for some time. Mm -hmm. I hope Hopefully they have. <laughs> okay. Let's turn to your book. Um, somewhere in it, you call Joe Biden part of the furniture of American politics. I love that expression. He's been around for 40 years. Obviously, the political scene looked very different back then. What drew him into politics and um, what was it like, Washington, back then? What was the difference? Yeah, it was, a t it was a totally different moment in the American political story. After all, polarization was very low. People mm -hmm. very often collaborated between Republicans and Democrats on various bills. And voters would, you know, split their ticket, as it's known, voting for Democrats for one office, Republicans for another. And, you know, I don't want to create an overly nostalgic image. There was a lot of Uh, a lot of terrible things going on in American politics in the early 1970s when Joe Biden arrived. But one thing it was not was as fiercely divided as it is now. And I think the mm -hmm. challenge that we're, a lot of us are thinking about is how does somebody who learned all of their political habits of mind, all of the the ways in which they think about government, how do they adapt to such a changed environment? And in fact, can he adapt? I think that's one of the big questions that he's facing. So why did he? go into politics? What does he want? What makes him tick? He, interestingly, um, there's, a, there's two motivations. One I would say is, is political in nature and the other one is personal. The political one goes back to the way that he and his family talked about issues, particularly of class and status. You know, his mother used to say when he was a kid that nobody is better than you and you are no better than anybody else. And his family was a 
they were an interesting example. They were a working class family, but they had had some some money in previous generations. The money was gone now. His father worked as a car salesman. And so there was the sort of some of the memory of uh, of having the trappings of aristocracy. And that made them very alert to issues of economic fairness. And so he got into this partly as an agent of the working class. But Mm -hmm. then there was a more personal piece of this, which is that when he was young, as you as you know, he had a stutter. Uh, really a crippling stutter, actually. I mean, as he said to me once, I couldn't speak. I mean, that's how profound Mm. it was. And Mm. the ability, sort of the the experience of getting over that gave him this somewhat overdeveloped, perhaps, a preternatural sense of confidence about speaking, about being in public life, of being being out there, meeting people. Mm -hmm. And he was really inspired by John F. Kennedy, actually, the other Roman Catholic Irish president. And Kennedy was inaugurated when Joe Biden was a senior in high school, a very formative moment in his life. And he came away with the idea that that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. And he set out to try to achieve it. So then an enormous personal tragedy hit his life. uh, And rather than committing suicide or drowning everything in alcohol, it drew him even closer into politics. How did this come about? And to me, one of the most fascinating chapters in your book is how you describe the role that the Senate played in Mm. this sort of period of Biden's life. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, it was, as you know, uh, a, a tragedy beyond all reckoning. I mean, the loss of his wife and his daughter was a horror. And He thought about suicide. He thought about becoming a priest and giving up on politics. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he approached an older priest about it, the bishop in Delaware, who said to him, well, I'm not sure you're cut out for this. Think about it for one year and then come back to me. And of course, he thought about it for a year. And that was the end of that. (laughs) The Senate, in fact, became his, call it his spiritual home. I mean, that was the place that swaddled him in that moment of vulnerability Mm. that said, we will give you form and structure and we'll give you a purpose. You know, we'll give you a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And uh, he actually talked to some older congressmen at the time, people who had had family tragedies of their own. And one of the pieces of advice that he got was throw yourself into your work, just work, 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 because if you stop working, you'll collapse, you'll fail. And uh, you need to have this thing. And so he did it and kind of got himself, you know, he became more or less wedded to the Senate. And curiously, one other detail of this that's important is because he was a single father, there was no mother at home. He would get on the train every night and go back to his home city of Wilmington, Delaware. It's about an hour on the train from Washington. But as a result of that, it meant that he was not a part of the Washington social scene. He was not a, a, a member of that inner circle of Washington power brokers. And it created a very unusual dynamic because here he is in Washington as a senator for 36 years, but always slightly hovering on that outer perimeter. And that turned out to, in some ways, that was a liability. Nobody really took him as seriously as they would have if he was a, you know, a member of the inner ring. But it was also to his advantage. It, it allowed him to maintain some sort of moderate sense of distance. So would you say that his relationship to institutions, especially the Senate is somewhat more important even than the, if you will, content of his politics, the sheer uh, mechanisms of? It's a good question. And I think it's one that is natural because we look at his career and it's not as if you say, okay, you know, Joe Biden was the father of healthcare reform or was, you know, mm. the innovator behind, uh, behind some great innovation in progressive politics. Um, He has some notches on his belt, things that he's proud of, particularly the Violence Against Women Act. Um, And then, of course, there are things he is not proud of. He was one of the authors of the crime bill, which has become, of course, very criticized in American culture, uh, the bill that was passed in the mid-1990s. I think that your analysis is exactly right. You know, in some ways, he was more wedded to the idea of negotiation and the exactly. possibility of compromise, the call it the political dignity of making uh, of making a compromise that you believe is for the for the overall good. Um, that's what he cared about. 
more than mm-hmm. any individual uh, specific policy agenda. Mm-hmm. When he started out, you describe him as being pure ambition. Mm. And that didn't, I mean, that got him into the Senate, obviously, but it also, he he also faced uh, a couple of harsh failures. And he got the furthest when he, well, I'm not saying he's not ambitious, but uh, you, you describe him. I mean, how did he change? Yeah. How did he evolve over the years? Yeah, it's a really interesting theme that runs through his life is the change and the ver- the sort of fluctuation of the nature of his ambition because he was as 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 you rightly put it in the beginning of his career he was running essentially an engine that was fueled by ambition i mean he was not there uh, in order to be the most liberal member of Congress or the most conservative he was there in order to be in Congress and rise through the ranks and he had a couple of moments that sort of um, embarrassed him a bit he was once giving a speech on the subject of oil wells in the Senate. And somebody who actually knew a lot about oil wells, and (laughs) Delaware doesn't have any oil wells, uh, they said, you know, Senator Biden, do you know anything about oil wells? And he he was Uh, uh, was kind uh, of uh. tucked his, yeah, tucked his tail between his legs a bit and had to go back. And and that changed him. He began to get a little more serious about preparing for the the work of the Senate. Remember, he was a very young man at that point. Mm. He was still barely 30 years old. He was mm. one of the youngest senators in U.S. history. And it took him a while. He had to learn the, uh, he really had to learn the business of governing. And there was a congressman once who visited the Senate late at night and uh, saw somebody there. There was nobody else in the Senate. Everybody had gone home. And he saw this person, and it was Joe Biden, there in the well of the Senate, just giving, as this person said, Congressman Steve Solars remembered it. He said he was giving a speech like a, a, you know, an orator in the Roman Coliseum. And he said, you know, here is, here is somebody who is just working on his tool, uh, his Mm. tool of, of, uh, of speaking and of being a member Mm. of the Senate. Uh, So Mm. he had to learn the ropes. (laughs) Uh, You've talked extensively to Barack Obama, um, and there have been a couple of insights that I find really fascinating. How did these two view each other? What did they learn from each other? Yeah, it was really, uh, uh, it turned out to be a successful relationship, and it was not guaranteed to be. Uh, Uh They were very different. Uh, (laughs) They had actually gotten off a bit on the wrong foot. Each one of them Mm. thought that the other one wasn't paying them enough respect. Um, (laughs) And interestingly, they really grew to recognize that they were stronger as a partnership than they were apart. I'll give you an example. Um, In the case of what what Barack Obama needed from Joe Biden was, look, we know what Obama had. He had these tremendous gifts of being able to inspire large groups of people. He could give this speeches mm-hmm. that were really quite remarkable. Um, and he was very he was very sophisticated in the way that he communicated the ideas of government. What he didn't have as much experience with was foreign affairs. This was all new to him. He'd been an Illinois oh. you know, state senator, and then he'd gone I to Congress. I thought you were going to say drinking beer with Mitch McConnell. That wasn't. <laughs> oh, there <laughs> is know. that, no, too. No, no, no. Go, uh, ahead. Go, go ahead. No. Which is one of my favorite moments, I have to say. You picked on one of my absolute favorites. But um, but so, you know, so he said, to, he said to Biden, he said, you do mm-hmm. Iraq. Meaning you manage this incredibly complicated process of, of withdrawing the American uh, presence from Iraq. And Biden was in charge of that. He did it. Um, but, you know, there was one moment, uh, actually, it was somebody who worked very closely with them who said to me later, the reason why that relationship worked was because each one thought he was the mentor to the other. Yes. And I thought that <laughs> yes. was a, an, elegant, an elegant description. Biden has always been described uh, I think as the personification of centrism, Mm. middle of the road, average Joe, and so on. Yet the ambitions that we get to see now, I mean, the political ambitions, I think he himself called more revolutionary even than those of Roosevelt. How did that come about? (laughs) Well, the big change, of course, was in the circumstances. I mean, the the yeah. moment that he is confronting as now president elect, soon to be president, are uh, really beyond anything that any president has faced in this country since Roosevelt, and arguably perhaps since Abraham Lincoln at the outset of the Civil mm-hmm. War. So, uh, you know, his natural home 
you know, ideologically is in the middle because he subscribes to a belief as one of his close allies put it to me. I, I think this is quite a good vivid image. One of his allies, James Clyburn in Congress said, American politics will swing from one side to the other all the time. But what it means is that it always passes through the center. And so it spends <laughs> twice as much time in the center yeah. as it does at the extremes. And Joe Biden very much subscribes to that view. Uh, but he has also recognized that this moment right now is unto itself and requires a level of ambition, uh, policy ambition, that is really uh, are, is revolutionary in nature. And he, and he mm. has um, come to that. Uh, he's come to that with the belief that he's not acting out of step with the American public. But in fact, his belief is the American public wants dramatic revolutionary change. Uh, they want serious change. He's being looked at. And that's, to me, the most interesting thing about Biden. How can he merge the different fractions of his own party. He's being looked at at the same time as a neoliberal and a puppet of socialism. How can he bring these two together? Well, he, he is, in a sense, what people see in him. They will ascribe to him all kinds of elements. Uh, and part of that is because of the the length of his career. He really has inhabited so many different moments in our political story that people, you know, they can accuse him of all kinds of crimes, political crimes. Uh, he can mm. either be too conservative or too progressive. That what he is in the end, I think the most, in many ways, one of the most incisive descriptions of him, somebody who worked very closely with him, who I talked to, said he is a nearly perfect weather vane for the center of the Democratic Party. And that moves. You know, the party has become more progressive, even, certainly over the last four years, uh, and it's likely to continue getting more progressive. And that means that he has had to move with it. So, you know, there are more conservative Americans who look at him and they say, well, he's just going to be a Trojan horse for the left because he's going to become the uh, uh, agent of that yeah. end of the party. Right. My, my sense of him, having talked to him over these years and uh, you know, in some detail about his basic political commitments, is that he's not an easy man to hold captive. He is a person who basically will make an assessment of where he thinks the politics are. And, mm. uh, and he will, he will disappoint people on the right. He'll disappoint people on the left. That is the nature mm -hmm. of the system as it is now. Uh, and he is not a person who is likely to be taken in a direction that is not consistent with what he deeply believes. Where are you on this debate, uh, about in this debate about identity politics, you know, uh, calling, the left wing of the Democratic Party of having lost, uh, you know, what what the average American cares about, um, having lost those that Hillary Clinton called uh, deplorables. How does he look at this conflict and how do you look at this conflict? Or does it bore you to death, the identity politics debate? I mean, it is, you know, it's interesting. Identity politics is what we call it now. But in fact, it's, it, you know, arguably, it's just politics. It's just that mm. we now announce the categories in ways that we didn't mm. before. And I, I think, you know, I think Biden in some ways is, uh, he is a member of the generation very clearly uh, that he came from. He cannot pretend to be 38 or 28. He is a 78 year old man. And he looks at some of the things that are happening in the culture now. And it's a bit bewildering to him. Um, mm. Let's be honest. I mean, he doesn't really understand absolutely everything that's happening, particularly on social media. But one thing he does understand is this long running uh, arc of the black freedom struggle. He believes in that mm -hmm. fundamentally. It's been a part of his life and he's made mistakes along the way, but it's been a part of his life going back to the 1960s, even before he was out of mm. school, he was taking part in desegregation protests. And mm. he then of course became the vice president of the first black president. And I think there, so he is to his core, he is aware of the reason why people are more emphatic today about their identities. Um, but his basic mm. belief is we're Americans fundamentally and that everything else comes mm. second. 
And that's mm-hmm. a bit of a countercultural argument, actually. Um, and he may find himself having to make that case and maybe not able to make it to everyone persuasively. Mm. Okay, final question. I'm sorry I've been keeping you too long, I think, already. Um, just do you think that he can be the healer that so many people hope he will be? Well, I like to keep expectations low. I think one thing we learned from Barack Obama's presidency was that he was actually, he was hobbled a bit by the sheer scale of the expectations. You know, he was given the Nobel Peace Prize before he'd even spent one year in office, made his life harder, not easier. Biden is in a different situation. Biden, people tend to underestimate him. My own Mm -hmm. sense is he possesses something quite rare at the highest ranks of American politics, which is that he has a personal acquaintance with suffering. He knows what it means to be in pain, to grieve, I mean, to mourn. And we are a country uh, in mourning right now, Uh, not Mm. just literally, uh, as we are for people in the COVID epidemic, but also politically, culturally, mourning for this notion of ourselves. And Biden comes to it with a belief that it is possible to pick yourself up off the ground and keep going. And that in itself is valuable. Wonderful, Evan. That was really great. Fabulous. I will, for one, keep uh, on reading your pieces and uh, keep us posted (laughs) and be safe. All right. (laughs) Thank you so much. It was great to be with you. Thanks for the conversation. Hope to see you again. Thank you. Okay, oh bye. Okay, ja, herzlichen Dank, meine Damen und Herren, für Ihr Interesse. Und ähm, das war So kommt das Kurs. Musik